Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman here in our Northwest Side studio. And I'm Paris Schutz reporting live from Logan Square on the city's Northwest Side. On the show tonight, state lawmakers are set to meet for the first time since the coronavirus pandemic set in. Two congressmen on the possibility of more federal aid. After two explosions, the controversial General Iron Plant stops operations, but is that enough? Fashionably fun artwork takes on social distancing and where you can now find comedy online. But first, Brandis, as we mentioned, I'm co-anchoring tonight from Logan Square. And in just a bit, we have a one-on-one -on -one with Mayor Lori Lightfoot on her first 365 days in office and including her latest statements on when the lakefront might be reopened. And then we'll have more on how Logan Square has been impacted by COVID-19, including a local nursing home that has had 28 COVID-19 related deaths. We'll have that and much more in just a bit. But first, Brandis, back to you for all the latest from today. Thanks, Paris. We'll see you soon. The light at the end of the pandemic tunnel may be getting just a teeny bit brighter. Today, Governor J.B. Pritzker shared that the state has reached another testing milestone. Among the most populous states in the United States, Illinois has now overtaken New York to become the number one state in the nation for testing per capita over the past seven days. As of now, all four regions of Illinois are on track and moving forward into phase three before the end of May. An Illinois health officials report 146 new deaths from COVID-19 since yesterday, bringing the total number of confirmed coronavirus, coronavirus deaths in the state to 4,379. More than 1,500 new cases were confirmed in the past 24 hours, bringing the statewide total of cases to more than 98,000. But as the state prepares to move to phase three of its reopening plan, Illinois Public Health Director Dr. Ngazi Azike reminded residents that the battle is not won. Hear me clearly, the virus is still out there. So staying at home whenever you can and keeping your distance from other people is still the way to stop and minimize the spread. What's left of the former Crawford power plant after a botched demolition last month is a threat to the public and needs to come down. That's according to Chicago Department of Buildings documents viewed by WTTW News. What remains of the plant's turbine building was slated for demolition last week, but the plan was put on hold after Little Village residents protested. According to the documents, large areas of the brick exterior are liable to collapse and scrappers have been trespassing, putting themselves at risk to scavenge materials from the site. Chicago's skyline may be in for a change. Alderman today advanced a proposal to build what may become the second tallest skyscraper in the city and the third tallest in the country. The $700 million development proposed by CIM Group and Golub and Company would rise more than 1,400 feet into the air from what is now a surface parking lot next to Tribune Tower. The project, dubbed Trib Tower East, would feature more than 500 apartments and a 200-room hotel. It's been criticized, though, for including only 11 residential units for low-income Chicagoans. The proposal, which has now cleared the Zoning Committee and Plan Commission, is scheduled to be considered by the full City Council tomorrow. And you can find much more about these last two stories on our website. Tomorrow marks one year in office for first-term Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot. She began her tenure as a political outsider determined to uproot the old system of aldermanic control that led to numerous corruption cases. But that all changed two months ago. Now the rest of her term will be defined by how she managed the COVID-19 crisis and how the city emerges out of it. Paris Schutz caught up with her earlier today at City Hall. Hey, Paris. Hey, Brennis. Yeah, this is a first year that looks much different now than it did three months ago. And as you mentioned, will largely be defined by the decisions she makes going forward as Chicago emerges from this lockdown and pandemic. And one of those decisions is when to open the lakefront. Now, she has said it will not open in June as part of Chicago's advancement to the next stage of recovery. And there's been a lot of pushback on that, including a Chicago Tribune editorial. Now, I asked the mayor about that today. She did not stick to that June time frame. And I asked her when that lakefront might reopen. We've got to do it in a way that keeps people safe. And that's, of course, going to mean limitations on hours, 
uh, limitations on kinds of activity. Are you saying that you could do this in June? I'm not gonna put a time limit on it. All, everything that we do has got to be dictated by where we are with meeting the various public health metrics that we set out. Um, but there'll be a time and a place, I'm confident this summer, where the lakefront will reopen. So not committing to a time frame there, but not committing to keeping it closed in June. Now, no more specifics on some broad ideas that she's put out there on helping out restaurants by closing down some streets and sidewalks to have restaurants do outdoor dining. She says she is in the works with the Illinois Restaurant Association on a plan that would provide that for restaurants and more. We're also looking at um, ways in which we can enjoy the cultural life of our city, music, theater, dance, um, all the things that we look forward to in public spaces. I think there are ways following the examples of other countries um, and other places in, the, um, in our country that we can do that. Of course, with limitations, we're not gonna see you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of folks body surfing um, and enjoying music, but I do think that we can bring the vibrancy of our cultural life to life in the outdoors and do it safely. And a more sobering uh, assessment of the city's financial forecast. As you recall, a couple months ago, the mayor was more optimistic, saying the city's budget could potentially weather the storm. But now she's saying the economic hit obviously is going to be significant here. One alderman, Anthony Beal, told us last week he thought the budget deficit could be between two and three billion dollars. Now she says there might be some one-time revenue enhancements that are needed to plug whatever the gap is going to be this year. I pressed her from, for some specifics on that. The shutdown of the economy has had a significant impact on city revenues, not just for 2021, but also in 2020. And so our team has been working diligently both to assess the impact, analyze it, make some uh, predictions about where we um, are going to be on a you know, two month, six month and so forth uh, basis and lots of different scenarios depending upon how quickly not only we reopen up, but how quickly the economy uh, recovers. So no specifics there, but look for that in the days and weeks to come. Now beyond the pandemic, Lightfoot's tenure has been defined by a somewhat chilly relationship with city council. And that goes all the way back to her inauguration where she kind of looked back on the stage and taunted aldermen saying, you know, the days of aldermanic prerogative and pay to play are over. And it's rubbed some aldermen the wrong way. They say that she has not reached out to work with them. Some aldermen say that she has, but there have been other aldermen that have. But she says to me she is confident in her relationship with city council and not concerned about some recent close votes. Am I going to please the people who are beholden to other special interests? No. Am I going to please those um, who want to maintain the status quo? Probably not. But I think if you look at the votes, uh, the vast majority of the uh, time, and I think in every instance, um, everything that we are um, pushing forward that we think is important, we've got a majority that agrees with us. But you know, you look at these 29-21 votes with the emergency powers and then the 29-19 vote with the pot delay ordinance. I mean, does that signal it's getting a little too close for comfort, especially when you've got a very difficult budget vote coming? I only need 26, and that's what I manage towards. I don't buy votes. I don't bully people. Um, I try to persuade them on what is in the best interest of all Chicagoans. And perhaps the second biggest decision of her first year has been the new police superintendent, David Brown. Find out what she says about the search for David Brown. You can find the full interview on our website, wttw.com slash news. And Brandis will be back in just a bit with how COVID-19 is impacting Logan Square, including why a local nursing home has seen an outbreak of more than 200 cases and 28 deaths. So stay tuned. Okay. One year down, Paris. We'll see what the next few hold. Thank you. Tomorrow, the Illinois legislature returns to Springfield for the first time in more than two months. But our Amanda Vinicky got a head start on lawmakers. She's there now with a preview live from outside the governor's office in the Capitol. Amanda. Brandis, legislators have actually seen each other since they were last in session March 5th, but over Zoom while they met in working groups, held press conferences, this will be the first time, as you said, that they are going to be back at the state capitol. And it is a special session 
doubly, actually. For one, it's literally a special session in that House Speaker Michael Madigan and Senate President Donna Harmon issued a joint proclamation calling legislators back to Springfield for what's called a special session. That means that it is going to be limited to just seven topics. Some are fairly broad, for example, a response to COVID-19, the budget, others a bit less so in that they'll be taking up or debating anyway actions relating to the November election. It's also, of course, special because of precautions being taken due to the coronavirus, including that legislators were encouraged to get tested for the virus before coming to the capital city. And then if they tested positive, they were told, please, don't come, stay home. At least one lawmaker will be doing just that. State Representative Edgar Gonzalez Jr., he's a Democrat from Little Village who was actually just appointed in January. He did test positive and so has said that he won't be taking part in this special session. Not just legislators, also legislative staff, even the media, were encouraged to get tested for the coronavirus. So this afternoon, I did just that. In Springfield, went to what had been a Walgreens, went through the pharmacy drive-up area where I was greeted by a tech, had to hold up my driver's license to a window, only opened it a tiny little smidgen in order to be able to hear what the tech was saying. They got my information and then gave some instructions. They said, peel the swab like it is an individually wrapped piece of string cheese, and then stick it up your nose about an inch. And then you're going to go around five times, just like that. It's going to feel so good, you're going to want to do it again on the other side, five times. And then you're going to put it cotton side down, back inside the packaging, just like that. Personally, better than somebody else doing it for me, though I gotta say it did feel a little strange and uncomfortable, but what's a girl to do? I followed instructions to a T. And taking my COVID test, opening up. You have to peel these carefully, tear apart. Grab the swab. And then I have to put it in one nostril. Ooh, and then the other. And they said high up. And put it back in. Down. Put it in a tote and turn it in. And ta-da! That was all it took and the suspense was short-lived. I tested negative for COVID-19, hence I'm in the state capitol right now. So again, got those results back pretty darn quickly, Brandis. Nice job taking that test, Amanda. So how else will this session be different than regular session? Well, for one, lobbyists were told to stay away. And in fact, I've talked to lobbyists that were encouraging one another to stay home and not be here for the session. And Madigan had said, please don't bring your family members. We don't want people who normally would bunk together to do so. And also, no whining and dining. Once the work of legislating is done, there's to be no parties, going out to restaurants, any of sort of the typical session business. Also, at the state capitol, when you enter, you have to be wearing a mask. Social distancing is encouraged and required. There are signs posted all throughout the state house telling anybody who visits just that. And we'll see tomorrow just how strict security is. We are expecting tomorrow to see a rally. Some of the reopen Illinois protesters set to be in Springfield ahead of the legislature are coming here. The Senate is going to be in the State House itself, but they won't all be in the chamber together. And said senators will rotate in when they, it is time for them to speak up during debate or to take a vote. So it could be a very prolonged process. The House not going to be meeting at the Capitol at all. Instead, they will be at the Bank of Springfield Convention Center in downtown. And we got a sneak peek of what that is going to look like from someone who was given a tour this afternoon. Noon, we saw the convention floor where, again, the, nor normally concerts. Uh, the go governor's inauguration has been held there, or at least the inaugural party. Instead, that is desks that are six feet at the very minimum apart. 
Today, House Speaker Mike Madigan announced that he wants the first order of business in the House to be adopting new rules that will require all lawmakers to wear masks. And if not, he says, if, the, if in fact this rule does pass, in a legislator does not come into this, what's acting as the House floor, not wearing a face covering, they could be disciplined, including being removed from what will be functioning as the House chambers that could set up a showdown, including with State Representative Darren Bailey, who has sued Governor J.B. Pritzker over his executive order. Now, Governor Pritzker, he's not here now. As you can see, the office is dark, but he is set to be at the Capitol tomorrow. Brandis, back to you. Okay, Amanda, thank you. We'll see you in a little bit. And now to Phil Ponce and members of Illinois' congressional delegation. Phil. Brenda's Memorial Day weekend is just around the corner, and by then, all 50 states will be at least partially reopened, despite 17 states reporting a growing number of COVID-19 cases. The push to reopen comes with unemployment claims hitting 36 million, and with the chair of the Federal Reserve warning that joblessness could reach Great Depression levels. Is the nation moving too fast to reopen? And what is happening in Congress with the next stimulus bill? Here with some insights, her Congress Jesus Chuy Garcia, a Democrat who represents Chicago's West Side. The district includes Cicero, Little Village, and Hermosa. And Congressman Rodney Davis, a Republican whose downstate district includes Taylorville and covers parts of Springfield. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Congressman Garcia, if I can begin with you. Uh, the uh, House uh, passed a $3 trillion stimulus bill, another one. Why is it needed? It's needed because people across the country are suffering as a result of the pandemic. Uh, people have lost their jobs, their hours have been reduced. They need to make their rent payments. They need to make their mortgage payments. There's a lot of hurt and suffering and a lot of angst about the future. So Democrats have unveiled this bill that we have passed and sent over to the Senate, recognizing the pain and suffering of workers and families across America. And it's a statement of the values that we think are needed and the response that uh, the federal government needs to engage in in order to make people's lives easier and help them get through this very difficult, unprecedented time of suffering. Congressman Davis, uh, all Republicans except one voted against it. You were not that one. Why did you vote against this stimulus bill? Well, I, I think it was a partisan bill. Uh, it was put together with zero Republican input. As a matter of fact, I think when you look back to the response to this pandemic, history is going to judge the first few months of our response in Congress very, very well. It was a historic time of bipartisanship where we came together to invest over $2 trillion in our economy to help our small businesses, our mom and pop shops survive. And instead of taking that bipartisanship to the forefront again, <laughs> Speaker Pelosi decided that she was going to draw up a bill in her speaker suite, put together $3 trillion worth of Democrat liberal wish list goodies, and try and put it, try and push it off as a, as a CARES Act bill. This was nothing but a partisan messaging bill, has zero chance of becoming law, and it's really disappointing. Congressman Garcia, Senator Mitch McConnell has said that the uh, bill is DOA. Uh, is it? The CARES Act uh, was initiated in the Senate. Uh, we worked on it and arrived at a compromise. Uh, that is the legislative process. So we expect to get a hearing in the Senate on this bill. And if Republicans want to change it in any way, they're free to do so. And then we'll see where we're at in terms of arriving, uh, arriving at a bipartisan uh, arrangement. But let us be clear that small towns and cities and counties all over the country, whether it's Illinois, in the South, in the West, in the North, they all agree that they're hurting badly. They have asked and begged the federal Congress for uh, assistance so that they can make up for lost revenues because of the pandemic. We're seeking to respond to that call and that need, and that's what this bill represents. It has the support of small time town mayors and city mayors and large city mayors as well, Republican and Democrat, because it's realistic in recognizing the local needs is seeking to respond and to keep our country going and to make it easier 
to get back to normal when the states deem that it's safe to do so. Congressman Garcia, let me stay with you for a second. Illinois has received $286 million for testing and tracing. You've made a point with the governor to uh, call for uh, tracers in the Latino community. Uh, what did you tell him? I told him that uh, in Illinois, there is a body of uh, experienced people who have been engaged in education, who have uh, been engaged in uh, getting word out about health care, signing people up for the Affordable Care Act, people who have uh, the trust and the knowledge of their communities. They're in cities ranging from uh, Southern Illinois to East St. Louis to Peoria and Chicago. Many of them are African-American and Latino, the hardest hit communities during the pandemic. So it's a ready-made body of people who can step in and have the confidence of the people that they're engaging so that we can find our way to a sense of normalcy while we defeat the coronavirus in, in Illinois. Congressman Davis, uh, President Trump told governors on a conference call Monday that he will, quote, step in if the federal government disagrees with state reopening plans. Uh, what's your reaction to that? Well, when you look at the plan that our governor put forth, uh, it's a plan that I wish he would have taken into consideration a little more of the regional differences in our state. Uh, the area that I serve is much different than the area that my good friend and colleague, Chewy Garcia, serves. And there's different uh, infection rates and different ways that we can deal with those who are infected. I, I certainly look at the phase plans that our governor put together and realize that outside of some of our metropolitan areas, most of Illinois should be in phase three right now. I certainly hope he reconsiders those plans. And at the same time, I do want to say thank you to the governor. Thank you for listening to me and other downstate Republicans when he began the process of reopening our health care facilities. The last thing that we needed in this country is a health care crisis where we had higher disease rates for diseases we know how to treat because people were too scared to go to the doctor or couldn't go see the doctor because they couldn't go to the clinic. Those are the types of issues that we've been able to see bipartisanship on. And I certainly hope we don't get in a tit for tat between the state and the federal government again. It didn't start too well at the beginning of this crisis for Governor Pritzker and also President Trump at the state and the federal level. And I want it to end well because we've got to we've got to continue to pull together and get our economy going again. Congressman Garcia, some people have uh, accused Governor Pritzker of overreaching. Uh, how would you assess his performance? Uh, the governor has been a, a real champion and a very commonsensical one uh, who has listened to the uh, health experts, especially the public health types who have helped uh, guide uh, Illinois. He was one of the first to uh, understand the importance of social distancing, the importance of fighting for personal protective equipment, and who understands uh, science and defers to the professionals uh, as we find a way to safely reopen the state and its economy. I think he's done a phenomenal job, and I think the ratings of uh, many governors who have handled themselves uh, similarly uh, speak for themselves. They have you know, uh, ratings in the 60s and 70s and even 80 percentiles. This is pretty unprecedented for politicians who are serving a first or second term, and this is why I think Illinois is in good hands. He is listening to as many people as possible, understands the difference in the regions of Illinois. And I think if people have an open mind and an open line of communication, which he seeks to keep, that the state is in good hands. Congressman Davis, last question for you, uh, Congressman. Uh, there have been reports across the country of farmers having to dump their milk, plow under crops, and euthanize livestock because they can't get their products to market. Are there any reports uh, of that, to your knowledge, here in Illinois? Uh, you know, in my district, there's there are not many dairy producers or specialty crop producers, but it's a big deal because it affects the products that we get in our grocery stores here in Illinois. Uh, as a matter of fact, today was the first day I saw our USDA program work. Uh, it was a program that I advocated for at the beginning of this pandemic directly to Secretary Purdue and his team to be able to get those products instead of seeing them on the ground or plowed underground, let's get them to our food, pan food pantries and food banks. And a few weeks ago, Secretary Purdue and the USDA announced that they would put together fam our farmers to families food boxes 
And as I was walking my dog this morning, I ran into two ladies who run our local food pantry. I asked them if they'd gotten any of those boxes yet. They did. They sent me a picture of one of the boxes for dairy products. So what has already happened within the Trump administration, within the USDA, is already paying dividends for those farmers who used to have to dump milk and get rid of produce. Now they're going to hungry families in my hometown and hometowns throughout America. Gentlemen, that's where we'll have to leave it. Congressman Garcia, Congressman Davis, thank you both for joining us. We very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And up next, Logan Square residents on the impact of COVID-19 in their community. But first, a look at the weather. Still to come on Chicago Tonight. The city temporarily shuts down operations at the General Iron Plant after two explosions, but neighborhood residents want more. An artist has fun making inflatable social distancing suits. Plus, Second City and other groups go online to keep you laughing. But first, we check back in with Paris Schutz, who is co-anchoring live from the Logan Square neighborhood on Chicago's northwest side. The neighborhood has been transformed by development in recent years, yielding dozens of trendy restaurants, boutiques and bars, as well as condos and new houses. But the influx of younger, wealthier residents has also led to significant displacement of many of the neighborhood's Hispanic Latino residents who've been in Logan Square for decades. Parishat joins us now with more from just off the neighborhood's namesake square on Kedzie Boulevard. Hey, Paris. Hey, Brandis. Yeah, Logan Square hasn't seen quite the amount of cases that nearby areas like Belmont Cragen has. Now, this neighborhood, which is marked by the beautiful boulevard system and this monument behind me, is in a zip code that has had 1,006 positive reported COVID cases. Now, the big outbreak here is at a long-term care facility called the Woodbridge Nursing Pavilion. It, as of Tuesday afternoon, has reported 204 positive COVID-19 cases and 28 deaths. That is the second highest in the state behind a Cicero nursing home that we featured a couple weeks ago. Now, the facility declined to be interviewed in person, but did offer us a statement saying that they have been proactive taking precautions and they feel better now that they are testing everybody. Quote, while the numbers are daunting, we are confident in the care we're providing by having this information to better care for our residents. Woodbridge Nursing Pavilion can confirm we've had 146 residents test positive. Five of those were admitted positive. We're happy to report that 22 of those 146 residents have already recovered and anticipating another 15 additional resident recoveries this week. Of those residents who remain ill with COVID-19, 46 are asymptomatic. We're also happy to report that due to our aggressive approach, we have had no new resident COVID-19 cases for the past two weeks. But again, 204 total cases, and they didn't tell us out of how many people that actually live there, but they do say the situation is better under control. And another situation in Logan Square over many years has been the issue of long-term residents who fear they are being displaced as this neighborhood rapidly gentrifies. Lots of expensive new buildings being built to replace old two and three flats. Obviously, the situation exacerbated in the COVID-19 pandemic. One group, the Logan Square Neighborhood Association, says they've distributed over $90,000 in cash assistance to residents since the outbreak began. We really are scrambling for getting families the support that they need. And, and, and also, mom and pop home, homeowners need help, right? So not all homeowners are billionaires, right, with, with thousands of, of units. Often they're two, you know, owners of two flats. And so they also need relief. And so we're seeing um, a population that's already been vulnerable on the northwest side that's quickly gentrifying before COVID. Uh, feeling even more vulnerable right now. And as the wave of development has occurred, Logan Square has become a hot spot for restaurants, trendy eateries. One of the first was Lula Cafe, which has been here for several years. It has been almost completely shut down for the entirety of this pandemic. And while they are struggling, owner Jason Hamill says it impacts other local businesses around them. The independent restaurants in the United States are, they're at the center of communities. Uh, and ways of life. And what I mean, we're at the center of the community is we tie together employees, patrons, um, spaces like Logan Square, uh, arts communities, uh, not-for-profits. 
to the supply chain of farmers and ranchers and florists like we use the florists across the street from us that we have a long time relationship with it's an inter it's a really interconnected web of of support so restaurants and some of those businesses struggling, but one business unexpectedly is booming right now. We stopped by the bike lane on Milwaukee Avenue where co-owner Max Hertz says he's essentially sold out of all his moderately priced bikes as more and more people look for a way to avoid public transit and a way to get some workouts in without going to the gym. What's unprecedented is that every bike in a certain price and quality range from all distributors is sold out. So not only are we sold out here, our suppliers and manufacturers are sold out as well. So even if I wanted to bring more stuff in, their supply is back ordered, delayed. It's even pre-selling now at this point. People are buying bikes before they're even delivered. So the bike industry, one of the industries doing well in the pandemic and shutdown. And we'll be back with more from Logan Square, including 35th Ward Alderman Carlos Ramirez Rosa. One of the critics of the mayor will have him respond to some of the things the mayor said today. Now, Brandis, back to you. Yeah, Paris, I know a few people who've gotten more into biking since all this has happened. OK, thanks. We'll see you soon. And now we go back to Amanda Vinicky, who's spent the day in Springfield ahead of tomorrow's special session. She joins us live now with a state lawmaker. Yes, Brandis, a state legislator who not only represents the state capital city, he lives here. Republican Representative Mike Murphy, by the way, I will add that if you come and visit Springfield ever for tourist occasions, you might have seen Charlie Parker's Quonset Hot Monster Pancakes, really good. Anyway, thank you so much, Representative Murphy. So can you please tell us um, that Speaker wants the House to adopt rules that he says are necessary for representatives in the public safety what are your thoughts on that? Do you plan on voting for those? Well, I, I haven't seen exactly what he's going to propose tomorrow, but in regards to what was put out last week, they ask us to take a test. They, they ask us to do uh, proper social distancing and wear a mask. You know, I've already taken my test. I will be wearing a mask tomorrow and I will be practicing social distancing. So I don't have a problem with that. So until I can say I'm gonna vote yes or no, I would like to see what the rules are. Because some of his proposals last week, I, I personally had a problem with, he said that while you're in Springfield, you couldn't have a roommate. My wife lives with me here in Springfield. So, uh, you know, after 42 years of marriage, uh, I wasn't going to go get a hotel or ask her to leave. And so, you know, it depends on what the rules look like. But in regards to living up to the spirit of being smart and social distancing, yes, I will abide by all those. Are you concerned that you're going to be put in a difficult position? There are some representatives, Republicans, who said they don't plan on wearing a face covering. What might you do should you be put in the difficult position of having to decide whether they should be permitted to remain on the floor? Well, first of all, I, I, uh, I hope they do decide to, for the protection of others to wear that. Uh, I know they have some, some issues on it, some even medical, they have brought up some medical concerns. Um, however, yes, I'm not going to feel concerned about my personal uh, health. You know, this is an important job. In my lifetime, we've never faced a crisis of this magnitude. And so it's very important for me to be down there to do my job. And I will take whatever risk necessary to fulfill my obligation to the people of the 99th district and, and also the people of the state of Illinois. I take it very serious. Do you believe that the session is going to be able to do enough? You only have three days and it's limited to just seven topics. Anything that is missing? Well, I, I'm disappointed it's a special session, to be honest with you. I, I've been asking for us to meet for the last three or four weeks. Uh, I had discussions with the BOS Center uh, almost three weeks ago. I, I reported that to both leadership, you know, that uh, the BOS Center was ready and willing. I think it's important we're here. We're a co-equal branch of government and separate from the governor's office. I think it's our obligation to be in Springfield meeting, and that's going to take more than three days. And I'm afraid we will have to leave it at that, but we will have a whole lot of coverage of what goes on these next three days, of course, in coming shows Chicago Tonight tomorrow. I'll be covering what happens. Brandis, back to you. Of course, Amanda, we're looking forward to hearing all about it tomorrow. Thank you. Up next, an investigation into two explosions in Chicago yesterday. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight Podcast and subscribe. 
The metal shredding plant General Iron on Chicago's north side has stopped all operations after what turned out to be two explosions that rattled the Lincoln Park neighborhood yesterday. WTTW News reporter Patty Wetley has been following the story and she joins us now with the latest developments. Patty, do we know what caused the two explosions at the plant yesterday? Uh, no, Brandis, we do not have that information yet. All we know is that uh, the fire department did say that an explosion took place on the conveyor system, but right now um, those explosions are under investigation both by the city and General Iron said that it also has its own engineers on site who are thoroughly investigating what could have been the cause. Now, in the meantime, General Iron, they did send this statement uh, just late this afternoon. It says, mm -hmm. quote, we will comply with every reasonable request and condition that the city imposes to ensure that public health and safety, as well as our employees and customers, are fully protected before resuming operations. Patty, is that enough for neighborhood residents? Uh, not for some neighborhood residents. I mean, uh, General Iron in that same statement, they did also acknowledge that the damage was significant enough that they actually can't operate their business as normal. Um, and the city is allowing them to have folks on site to do necessary maintenance and repair work, but no metal shredding is um, either allowed or they're not capable of doing that at this point. Neighbors um, have been trying to get General Iron shut down completely prior to this. So the fact that the language that the city is using leaves it open for when General Iron makes the repairs, inspections are done, permits are issued, um, there's the potential or the likelihood that they will go back to operating as they were before the explosion. So um, neighbors, some neighbors are not really happy with that. And remind us of the history between General Iron and the city and environmental activists. Yeah, so there are neighbors there who, and you know, keep in mind that this area, even though it is in Lincoln Park, um, was a heavy industrial area back in the day. Um, and so you had operations like metal shredding going on there, and there used to be very different environmental rules. So there have been issues lately where neighbors say that they're in, emitting too many pollutants into the air. And of course, during the COVID-19 pandemic, respiratory issues are of paramount concern. Um, neighbors also complain about this fluff that um, leaves the plants area and settles on surfaces in the neighborhood. So they're concerned about metal toxins. Um, and General Iron, we should note, was cited in 2018 by the US EPA for violations of the Clean Air Act. And in 2019, um, a consent was signed by both the EPA and General Iron um, to control their emissions. Um, but neighbors aren't really thrilled that those levels that they're allowed to operate under are actually um, what people who live near there want to be inhaling on a regular basis. So and Patty, a lot to unpack. Yeah, what's next for General Iron? Are operations expected to start again at some point? You know, if they can get those repairs made and they can prove to the city that everything is structurally sound and that emissions are under control, then I think that it could be reasonably expected that they might be allowed to reopen and start up operations. But they are, it should be noted, planning to vacate that site supposedly at the end of 2020 and move their operation to the south east side of Chicago. Um, and that application is currently under review by the Illinois EPA, which is expected to make a decision on that permit application by the end of this June. So there's a lot in flux actually right. for this company. Yeah, and I know I think some uh, community activists in that area uh, have uh, voiced their opposition to General yes. Iron's moving as well. And we'll have Precisely. more on General Iron on tomorrow night's program, including local alderman Brian Hopkins. Meanwhile, my thanks to Patty Wetley. Thanks, Brandis. And you can read Patty's full story on our website. That's at WTTW.com slash news. And now we check back in with Paris Schutz, who's co-anchoring tonight in Logan Square. Paris, I understand now you are joined by one of the neighborhood's aldermen. Yes, that's 35th Ward Alderman Carlos Ramirez Rosa joining us now. Thanks so much for being out here. So, Alderman, we want to talk about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. But first, you know, we spoke with Mayor Lightfoot today on her first year. 
It has been marked by sometimes a tense relationship with city council. Um, what has your experience been in terms of her relationship with Alderman? Well, you know, I said on the day of Mayor Lightfoot's inauguration, if she puts forward a progressive policy vision, I'm going to be standing right there next to her championing those pieces of legislation. Unfortunately, I think myself and many other progressives have felt that she has not lived up to her promises. And that can be very frustrating at times. You know, when you have a mayor that has committed to certain pieces of progressive policy, you want to work in earnest with the administration to get these things done. And then you don't have the partnership that you felt was possible well, there. What so, specific promises? Well, I think. First and foremost, we see that we do not have an elected school board going one year into her administration. We see as well that we saw Lincoln Yards move forward, despite the fact that she said she was going to block that. And the previous mayor said that he would give her the ability to wait until she took office to move forward on that. I think we also see that when it comes to issues around housing and tenant protections, there are two very important measures right now before the city council that will protect people in this community and all across Chicago from facing evictions the moment the stay at home order is lifted. To date, she has not worked with progressives on the council to move that forward. And on, on that subject, I mean, that's a big concern here as the shutdown is still ongoing and, and during the pandemic. So can you give us some context of, of how big a problem that affordability crisis is in Logan Square well, right we now? We saw that the city of Chicago put forward a COVID-19 housing assistance grant. 2,000 families were going to receive a $1,000 grant over 83,000 households applied. So that's just one metric that shows the dire need that exists. My office put a call out to say, we will help you fill out this application in English or in Spanish or whatever language you speak. In that week, in the several days leading up to when the application was due, we got over 600 phone calls of people seeking assistance. So we get phone calls not just from tenants that are struggling to figure out what they can do in this moment, but we also get calls from landlords who say, hey, I'm freaked out. I don't know how I'm going to be able to pay my mortgage. And so this is something that all of us are facing in this moment, and we need to come together to figure out how we're going to keep people C in their certainly homes. Certainly, like if landlords are not getting rent from their tenants, they struggle too because they have bills that they have to pay. So that $2 million grant fund ran out right away, like you said, is there reinforcement? Well, one of the measures that a lot of other cities have pursued is making sure that tenants who are impacted by COVID-19 and are not able to pay their rent while a stay-at-home order is in place have time to be able to pay that over the next year once the stay-at-home order is lifted. So unfortunately, the mayor's allies on the city council and the realtors are blocking that right now. It's a measure that's been put forward by Matt Martin, alderman of the 47th Ward. It's a sensible, reasonable policy. All it's saying is that if you were unable to pay your rent as a result of COVID-19, you have a year to figure out with your landlord how you're going to pay the rent that you owed as long as the stay-at-home order was in place. So if that means you owe April, if that means you owe May, you're going to have 12 months and you can pay that in increments, you can pay it all at once. But we're scared here in Logan Square and across the city that we're going to see just a slew of evictions filed and acted upon once that stay-at-home order so is lifted. So it looks like that that ordinance might uh, have quite a, a battle uh, waged behind it. Um, lastly, Alderman, you do have a new building going up That's that right. we've reported on on WTTW.com. Uh, tell us about this affordable housing building. Well, when I took office, I committed to make sure that we would fight for affordable housing right here in this community to address the displacement. And I joined with Logan Square Neighborhood Association. I joined with United Neighbors of the 35th Ward. We knocked on doors. We rallied. We marched. And we are now bringing a 100-unit affordable housing development home. Just behind us on the other side of the square, there is a underutilized city-owned parking lot. That underutilized city-owned parking lot, if everything goes as planned at Wednesday's city council meeting, will become 100 units of all affordable housing. All right, well, we'll follow that, Alderman. Carlos Ramirez Rosa, thanks for being here. Thank you, Paris. And Brandis, we'll wrap things up from Logan Square in just a bit, but now we go back to you. Yeah, Paris, that's something to follow, affordable housing in a community where the, the price of living there has been rising because of its popularity. We'll see you in a minute. Right, right. One local artist is blowing up during the shutdown. You'll see what I mean in a second. This art teacher enlisted her kids for an inflatable art show in their yard. Arts producer Mark Vitale has the story. Oh my God. Two teenagers model their mother's latest artwork called Extreme yeah. Protection Suits. My work is really grounded in, in the idea of wanting to be as democratic as possible. And so humor is a really important place for me to draw people in and think about entertainment and slapstick humor. And I think in terms of all the seriousness and the trauma that's happening right now, I was really interested in, in using humor as a way to deal with trauma. I think a lot of the time it's, it's uh, 
laughing is a welcome relief, right? Or is a way to get through hardship. Ow. The suits were made for a spring show at the Hyde Park Art Center, now postponed until August. Born and raised in Scotland, Claire Ashley teaches at the School of the Art Institute. She's been making large-scale inflatables for years and sometimes makes videos of the works with unexpected songs. That monumentality in the work is built on the kind of desire to take up as much space as possible as a woman in the art world, right? Um, and to really think about obnoxiousness and absurdity and um, over-the-top ridiculousness as part of its humor and part of its visibility. I want them to be flexible, I want them to be adaptable, I want them to have kineticism and speed as opposed to kind of the monumental sculptures from the 60s who were making these heavy steel, solid, massive public sculptures that, that uh, would kill people if they fell on them. For fabric, she uses Tyvek, or nylon with PVC coating. It's very low tech in some sense. I buy uh, small tabletop fans. Um, I glue those into a Walmart kids backpack. The backpack gets stitched into the fabric and then it gets plugged into the wall. And I really do love that quality of the inflatable as a living, breathing um, being in the world. And certainly in terms of my offspring, I certainly think of them in relationship to these those sort of uh, beings that I take care of in a different way than I do the kids. I get to control them in a way different way than I unfortunately don't get to control my children anymore. We asked her daughters what they think about all of this. I'm pretty tired. Uh, I was woken up for this. But it's kind of cold in here, which is nice. It's pretty weird. Feels like you're kind of in a cloud. Yeah, it's, it's hard to move. It definitely feels like you have like a, a bunch of weight on you. It's definitely something to brag about to my friends. Um, I put it on my story and they're like, what's going on? This is a good yeah. way for a mother to protect their daughters in terms of social distancing. They can't do a thing. They're, they're tortured. For Chicago Tonight, this is Mark Vitale. And there's more from artist Claire Ashley on our website, including that entire music video with the country and western song. And right after this, we're back with an inside look at how some comedy outlets like Second City are delivering shows virtually. Don't miss one of our stories. Get them all delivered to your desktop or mobile device with a subscription to the WTTW News Daily Briefing. Go to WTTW.com slash Daily Briefing and sign up. It said laughter is the best medicine. And while the CDC might not fully back us up on that one, we could all probably use something to help us with the ongoing challenges of staying at home during the pandemic. And some of the funniest comedy troops are stepping up to the challenge. Here's a taste of one of Second City's new weekly live online shows, Improv House Party. The question I have for our audience is, what was the last normal thing you remember doing before everything shut down? There's a lot of good ones. You know what? Getting a haircut. I can relate to that one right there. Oh, what do you want to do with your hair today? You know, I was thinking really just changing it up. <laughs> Joining us are Annalise Toft, director and instructor at the Second City, and Brandon Cloyd, artistic director of Playmakers Laboratory. Welcome to both of you to Chicago Tonight. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Um, yeah, so thank An you so much. Of course. Annalise, let's start with you. You know, tell us how a company sure. that is famous for its live improv shows goes online. Uh, well, we're forced to, <laughs> for starters. No, but I think also at the heart of what we do with improv is we react to the moment and we pivot live as an ensemble. And so when we were asked to make a pivot, when the world required a pivot, we made it. So we all jumped in Zoom and we started experimenting and uh, trying out new things and learning as we went. What, what are some of the comedic possibilities that are opened up by uh, staying at home, by our stay at home lives? Yeah, well, absolutely. It's just like you said, it's a stay at home life, meaning that when we come to an audience, we're not just showing them a video of a sketch, we're doing it live, 
with them while they're in their homes. So we have the ability to pull up audience members on screen if they volunteer. We, we don't harass you that way. But we can take a tour through an audience member's home. And uh, for example, we did a bit where we gave a tour of an Airbnb that was actually an audience member's home. So we can come into your lives. We can do improv with your pets. We can see what's in your fridge and you get to see our home. So it gets to be a communal experience. And Brandon, your company, Playmakers Laboratory, has a weekly half-hour show written by CPS students on Patreon, and it's titled, That's Weird, Grandma, House Party. Let's see a short clip from the show. Are you ready to go? No. Let's get moving. No. Now, that was written by a CPS student. Brandon, tell us about making an online show for an audience of grade school kids. Absolutely. So um, what's so great about our work is it primarily happens in the schools first and foremost. And I was actually a teacher who got to teach that student, uh, Jesus, who wrote the Oregon Trail. Um, and so what we're doing now is we're reimagining these plays that we created as theater pieces uh, and turning them into digital plays that we can then reach both our CPS school audiences, but as well as um, students and parents and teachers who are stuck at home um, from all across the country. Um, and you're also streaming this on Patreon, which is a subscription service. Why not make it free? Um, so we do still make it accessible and free to all of our students. Um, but as a nonprofit, we still have to raise some, uh, some money and some funding um, so that we can go back into the schools and offer them that programming. Um, so, at the, so we kept it at a low rate of like $2 to start with, uh, just so that it feels accessible and enjoyable to folks, whether they're Chicago natives or not. Now, Annalise, though, your shows are free. How does anyone make money? <laughs> well, we don't, and Second City <laughs> currently isn't, but um, we are raising money through these free shows for our alumni fund. Um, so for members of our community who are experiencing financial or health distress, uh, they're going to use that money for frivolous things like rent and insulin. Um, so the show is free, but we, we ask that if you're in a position to donate, consider it. <laughs> like rent or insulin. That's, I know that's frivolous. You don't need that stuff. Um, no. Brandon, what do you like about this model? Um, I think it's a really fun creative challenge for us as uh, performers and actors to try and uh, discover new ways that we can adapt stories. Um, and with the film model, we get to play with uh, new techniques. Uh, we get to show things on screen that we haven't shown before. Uh, we get to take the audiences to, to places that we maybe weren't able to create when we're creating it live on stage. One of the other things I noticed, Brandon, is you guys have to, uh, sort of a, you said it's a digital thing. You know, you got a lot of um, sort of a high production value. There's a lot of, there's a lot of videos going on. Tell us a little bit about that. Thank you. So all of the videos are, are created and adapted by the performers themselves. Uh, I appreciate the comment about the, uh, the uh, production value. We're, we're literally doing it on iMovie and on our Macs at home. Um, and, and we're meeting that challenge head on um, and we're really proud of the work. Um, and I think what's most important is that there's story, good storytelling and good laughter. Um, and and uh, so far, I'm, I'm loving what the actors are, are putting in front of us. And Annalise, your audience is, it's, you know, they've been greatly expanded by using this new platform. How large is your audience and where are they coming from? They're coming from all over the world, and we've had audiences anywhere from like 500 to 2,500 people per show. Um, but yeah, we've, we've pulled up and interviewed and celebrated audience members in Australia and the Bahamas and like all over the place, which also, if you consider the time difference, is pretty crazy, and that's dedication to comedy. But it's really been wonderful to reach out and, and touch people all over the globe. And one of Second City's recent online shows, it's not improv, but it's still very funny. Not editorializing, if I call it funny. It's, you know, I could call it a fact. Um, yeah. But it's called The Last Show Left on Earth. And this first one was hosted by Jack, Jack McBrayer. A lot of us know him from 30 Rock. Um, tell us what you're missing by being stuck, you know, in sort of your own Zoom box. There's, you're not able to get out into the big wide world. Oh, yeah. Well, so uh, Last Show on Earth was uh, a streaming video show where they actually they made all the content and edited it in its own home. So that one really looked beautiful. Um, it, it's something you can click and you can still watch online through Topic. Our shows that we're doing currently at the live shows, um, there's a little bit that you're missing because you're stuck in your own box in the sense that we we can't always hear your laughter. We can't feel that give and take from the audience. 
but we really do try to create the Zoom version of it by getting suggestions from the audience. We do Q and A's, we do polls. Um, and so we really try to make it feel like we're all in this room together as much as this possible when that's something we really need. And Brandon, what about for you? What do you feel like you're missing um, by having to do this uh, digitally versus with people? Well, I think the biggest challenge and what we're missing is, is the interaction with the students themselves. Um, we are fortunate enough that one of our school partners is inviting us back to finish out a residency at the end of this year, um, and we'll be creating a digital show for them as well, too. Um, so I look forward to, uh, to learning about what uh, in-classroom teaching is like via Zoom uh, and to get to see the students' faces again. Okay. My thanks to Annalise Toft and Brandon Cloyd. Best of luck to you both. Thank you. Thank you. And that's our show for this Tuesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and of course our website, wttw.com slash news. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. That's right, one-on-one -on -one with Chicago's new top cop on battling violence and the coronavirus. And virtual music lessons with the Hyde Park Suzuki Institute. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And a pair of shuts, thanks for watching. Stay healthy, stay dry, and we'll see you tomorrow. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, serving Chicago as a personal injury law firm since 1984.